Good afternoon. Welcome to all the people who join us in the webinar number 164 since the Andean Health Organization, the Politunani Agreement, started the cycle of web seminars in May 2020. Today we will present webinar titled Rare Diseases, From Health Policies to Patients' Rights. To begin with, we will give two key messages. First, COVID-19 pandemic has caused a major setback in regular vaccination in our countries, which has increased the risk of recurrence and outbreaks of dangerous vaccine-preventable diseases. The pandemic has taught us as a lesson the relevance of strengthening health systems and developing all relevant strategies to ensure the vaccination of all people throughout the life course, their life course. Second, the COVID-19 pandemic teaches us that the capacities built and strengthened in these three years should not be rolled back. Research, epidemiological and genomic surveillance, vaccine and drug development, deployment of prevention measures, and a good communication remain fundamental for a caring society. Under this premise, the ORAS CONFU is very clear about its coordinating role and continues to open dialogues and interventions with the participation of all sectors to ensure a dignified life for the inhabitants of our countries. Reflections on these and other priorities relevant to health and well being can be found in the monthly Notice Salud Sandinas newsletter available on the website of the Andean Health Organization. Accordingly, today, Tuesday, March 14, 2023, we open our virtual doors to discuss a topic of great importance for our region with this webinar number 164, rare diseases from health policies to patients' rights. We invite you to leave us your name, organization, and country from which you're joining us through the comment box of the Facebook Live or YouTube Live chat. In that same space, you can leave your questions or send them via email to webinar or as conhu at gmail.com. To access the certificate of attendance to this webinar, as usual, you must fill out a short survey and leave your data in the fixed link found in the Facebook Live or YouTube Live chat. The certificate will be sent to your email in the next few days. This webinar will be developed with the usual dynamics. We will start with the institutional greeting, then the dissertations of our speakers, the active force and the space for Q&A. In this important day, I give the floor to Dr. Maria del Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of the Oras Conhu, who will give the welcome and institutional greeting. Go ahead, Dr. Calle. Thank you, Magda. Good afternoon. Welcome to all the participants today. March 14, 2023, are with us, especially to the speakers and experts who will speak today on the highly relevant topic of rare and orphan diseases. We have Hernan Sepúlveda from the Sub-Regional Program for South America, from PAHO WHO, who will give us an institutional word Dr. Patricia Gallardo, international consultant in non-communicable diseases in the sub-regional program for South America for PAHO. Eva Maria Ruiz, representative of Latin America Patients Academy, LAPA. And Dr. Natalia Messina, director of specialty and high price medicines of the Ministry of Health of Argentina. The Indian Health Organization, the Politunano Agreement, has 51 years 
of uninterrupted work in favor of the health and well-being of our six countries. We're talking about Bolivia, Colombia, Chile, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela, which means more than 168 million people in the area of these six countries. Every February 28th is commemorate the International Day for Rare Diseases, a date that highlights the struggle of hundreds of thousands of people around the world who have a rare or orphan disease and seek to increase the visibility and strengthening of interventions that allow a real attention to their health needs. Therefore, the Oras Konhu has been assuming this challenge within our lines of intervention and has been developing actions to coordinate efforts between the governments of the six Andean countries in favor of people living and suffering with a rare and orphan disease, promoting the development of policies and plans to improve the quality and improving their care. There are approximately 7,000 rare and orphan diseases affecting 8% of the world's population. Million. Most of them arise in childhood and less than 5% of cases are treated. Globally, access to medicines is poor, less than 1% of patients. But inequalities are clear. In high-income countries, the percentage points are nine times higher. The challenges derive from their low prevalence, lack of knowledge, and scarcity of experience in their management, as well as their chronic, degenerative, and potentially fatal, fatal nature, have led that rare diseases to emerge as a public health priority that should be recognized in all our countries, by all health authorities and institutions. There is a complex road ahead, which will allow us to en encourage the coordinated work in search of progress in the exercise of the rights to health and a response to the needs of patients who suffer from them. We congratulate all the organizations, especially those of the patients who struggle every day to achieve a place in their health care. Equality, timely, inclusive care, and a dignified and fairer life, for which it is required, among other priorities, to improve the technology and opportunity for a timely diagnosis, to speed up the processes that authorize the delivery of very high cost drugs and the necessary technology. And of course, with scientific and ethical support. Strengthening alliances between the various stakeholders geneticists, immunologists, pediatricians, first-level physicians, clinical researchers, decision makers, the pharmaceutical industry, and patient groups. In addition to the coordinated intersectoral and intergovernmental work, this is a task and commitment still pending that we have to execute 
in order to achieve results, an impact on the health, quality of life, and care of our patients with rare and orphan diseases. The Andean Health Organization, Ipoli Tunani Agreement, it has clear that we need to continue contributing to the health and well-being of 168 million people who live in our countries and make this right to the best possible level of health. Thank you very much once again. Thank you, Dr. Calle, for your opening words. Now for an institutional greeting on behalf of the Pan-American Health Organization, World Health Organization, South American Subregional Program, we give the floor to Mr. Hernán Sepúlveda, Regional Advisor in Human Resources in Health. Go ahead, Mr. Sepúlveda. You have the floor. Good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to participate in this important event. Greetings from Bogota. We are participating in another meeting, but we always want to be present in at least in the opening of this event. Patricia, she is a specialist. She will remain to the entire meeting. I just have two comments, important comments on this topic. I think that these are unknown diseases, and therefore there's still a lot of information in order to talk about the treatment, and there's a lot of trained human resources to have a better response. The second comment has to do with the high cost that the diseases have because there's not too much research associated to the treatment. So this makes this a serious problem for a country where you have one or two persons with this disease. Impact is not that high because there are other priorities, but for people who suffer them. So perhaps you would have to say why not we strengthen the dialogue among countries so each country can search or look to specialize in a specific type of disease and through solidarity and exchange. If a person from a country has a disease that's been, has a treatment that is more developed in another country through an agreement, they can work together. Obviously, that's not going to be a short-term but I do believe that from the exchange of experience among the countries, we can make progress. We, with Mari Carmen, she's in the second floor. I'm here in the underground floor in a meeting of human resources where I think that the most valuable thing has been how countries are willing to exchange their experience. So I think that the Andean Health Organization is going to be able to collaborate in this occasion. So thank you very much. I wish you an excellent webinar and we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Mr. Sepulveda, for your words. And now, after the institutional greetings, I introduce myself. My name is Magna Hinojosa, physician by profession and responsible for the life course and other thematic lines of the Orascon. After this preamble, to address the political framework that contributes to improve the life of people living with rare diseases at the international level. We will begin this event by giving a warm welcome to Dr. Patricia Gallardo, international consultant in non-communicable diseases in the sub-regional program of South America for the Pan-American Health Organization. Doctor graduated from the Universidad Nacional de Tucumán in Argentina, specialist in gastroenterology and hepatology, currently an international consultant for the sub regional program for South America, PAHO WHO, SAM, former director of the National Cancer Institute of Argentina, master in health systems and social security with a thesis pending, founder and former president and former executive director of Fundación Sayani, currently teaching and training human resources, former auditor in liver diseases, transplantation, and high cost in the Ministry of Health 
of Jujuy and in the social work of the province. She has more than 20 years of experience in healthcare and 10 years of experience in management, achieving agreements in public, provincial, and national health systems and in national and international NGOs. She has an extensive experience in team leadership, results oriented, and she's expert in strategic planning and innovation among other important aspects. Welcome, dear Dr. Patricia Gallardo. You have the floor. Thank you, Magda, for that nice introduction. Jujuy is the province in the north of Argentina. Thanks to the Horas Conu for the invitation. My greetings to all of you. I'm going to share my screen and start my presentation. I'm going to talk about the political framework that contributes to improving the lives of people living with rare diseases at the international level. But in order to talk about this, I think that we need to go into context. The first causes of death in the Americas are chronic non-transmissible diseases. Number one, we have cardiovascular diseases, followed by respiratory diseases, diabetes, cancer, cirrhosis, more, not only mortality, but also jealous in South America. We can see we don't have rare orphan diseases detailed here, so it's important to continue working so this starts to be visualized. There's a current agenda from WHO and the Pan American Health Organization. Our SDGs and are clearly affected by the pandemic. And these people that live with chronic disease, in this case, rare orphan diseases, also decrease their access to the health system and decrease their time for diagnosis, and many of them decrease their access to treatment. As Dr. Kaye mentioned, there are more than 300 million people living with a rare disease worldwide. There's a lack of public awareness of rare diseases that results in an increased risk of social exclusion and multiple forms of discrimination. More than 6,000 diseases are identified, most of which begin in childhood. People live with these symptoms for many years and they never get a diagnosis. As we mentioned, most are chronic, progressive, and frequently life-threatening. We know that they are rare, one in 2,000 people, 50% children with early death. As I mentioned, most of them are not diagnosed and these are just symptoms and their disabilities or the manifestation without getting the name of the diagnosis. 80% has a genetic origin and it's estimated in Latin America, 40 million people live with rare diseases. At the level of the political framework in 2018, Several statements were the right to health of rare diseases of Ju June 18 to Ju July 6 in Geneva was promoted by four civil organizations, the International Thalassemia Federation, the Agreca Foundation, the International Federation of Hydrocephalus and Spina Bifida, and the NGO Committee of Rare Diseases that talks about the, this drive for this three sector in all NGOs to promote public policies for these diseases and have access to health. In 2019, we include rare disease in the resolution of Council resolution on access to medicines. The people can enjoy the highest level possible of physical and mental health. In May of 2019, we include these diseases in the report of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in the economic, social, and cultural rights. In topic three, it talks about people with rare diseases and the reality that they suffer. And this is the setting in terms of universal health coverage. Then in October of 2019, in the context of, United, of universal coverage, have access to 
health quality service with financial protection and is not driven into poverty by health care costs. We mentioned that it's a treatment of high cost makes that many times it's very difficult to have access to treatment. In October 2019, the countries adopted the United Nations Declaration on the Universal Health Coverage. And this commits all governments to redouble efforts to address rare diseases in their plans to achieve universal health coverage. In this document on December 16 of 2020, from WHO, the list of essential medicines that are a small proportion of the total number of drugs approved and market against this type of diseases worldwide. And the objective is to assist member states in prioritizing medicines for public financing, procurement, and reimbursement. And this is a milestone that in December 16 of 2021, the United Nations adopted the first resolution on addressing the challenges of people living with a rare disease in their family. And this focuses on the importance of non-discrimination and promotes the fundamental foundations of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, to education, and work, reducing poverty, combating gender inequality with a gender perspective and supporting we, as, as PAJO for the South Regional Problem, with our counterparts that we work at the integration institutions of ORAS PONU, Mercosur, and ORCA, and we can see their convergent agendas, as you can see here. It is a joint effort, a team effort to start working, so this rare and orphan diseases start to be visualized, strengthening their treatment and their timely access. And we see our role in our responsibility. So there is universal access to these medications, but also a comprehensive, good quality medicine. I wouldn't leave, I wouldn't, I would like to mention the work that from the first day, thanks to a great effort of civil society and NGOs, both in the International Alliance for People Who Live with Rare Diseases, the Latin America Alliance of Patients, so, that's an alliance and Argentina partnership in Argentina that so nobody left behind. So thanks to this effort, the intersectoral effort is so important with the government and government organizations, scientific society. You, with this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, Dr. Patricia Gallardo. Today, you have given us, put us in the context. You have explained us that within the first causes of death, these diseases are not seen, are not included. There is a lack of awareness of the importance of these diseases. Some of them, as you mentioned, have not been identified yet that affect mostly children and that result in severe disabilities and a high possibility of an early death. I've also mentioned that in Latin America, there's a significant number of them and we see each one independently with a rare disease. We have two, three or four cases in a country, but if we add all of them, as you mentioned, Latin America has almost 40 million people that live with the diseases. You also highlighted how in 2019, rare diseases were included in a resolution of human resources in terms of access to medication and vaccines. The custom of achieving the rights that every person may enjoy of the highest possible level of physical health and mental health. Likewise, in 2020, you indicated how the WHO issued a list of essential medicines 
which are a small proportion of the total number of drugs approved in market against rare and orphan diseases worldwide. And finally, highlight that the PAJO is working with integration institutions such as ORAS, CONU, and MERCOSUR, and ORCA. And there is a commitment of trying to achieve that universal access to these drugs and the necessary technology for early diagnosis and timely management. Dear Dr. Patricia Gallardo, we reiterate our thanks for the presentation and we invite you to remain in the room to carry out the dialogue in response to the question of the participants who will ask at the end of the presentation. Thank you very much. Next, to address a successful experience in orphan drug policies, improving access to the treatment of rare and orphan diseases, I warmly welcome Dr. Natalia Messina. She's a lawyer by profession, director of specialty and high price medicines of the Ministry of Health of Argentina, vice president of the Bar Association of the Judicial Department of Quilmes, head of the law firm m, &M Abogados, former regional executive director of UGL7 La Plata of the Institute of Social Services for Retired and Pensioners, PAMI, from 2016 to 2020, a master in health and social security system of the University of Salud in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Master in Administrative Law at the University Universidad Austral, member of CONAMI National Commission for Patients with Spinal Muscular Atrophy, member of CAPAFIC, the Advisory Council for the Approach to Speak Fibrosis, member of CONETEC, National Commission for the Evaluation of Health Technologies, and she was specialized in health services management at the University Torcuato de Tela and in Introduction to Health Economics at the Universidad Nacional de Comahue. Welcome, dear Dr. Natalia Messina. The space is yours, and you have 20 minutes for your presentation. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much to everyone, especially to the Oras Cono for this invitation here from the southern part of Latin America. And to tell you the experience in our country of frequent diseases, now I'm going to tell you what we have, what's going on in Argentina. It is known as rare or orphan diseases. I'm going to share my screen with my presentation. The introduction made by Patricia because it gives us the frame of what are the rare diseases in the world and in the region and how uh, just give me a minute. Please let me know if you can see the slides. Yes, great. Here, here we are. Well, so, tell you, Argentina is not the exception in the region in terms of how we approach this type of pathologies, but it does. There's a specific law before that. I will tell you there's a specific law for infrequent diseases and it's defined by the amount of people who are diagnosed with relationship to the inhabitants. Our law states that when a disease is one in 2,000 people, we can consider it as a infrequent disease and that's how it's defined. In most of the countries, it's defined similarly but not in every country, or it has the same amount of people per inhabitant, and that differs in the region. So this is the first problem that has to do with the definition of what is a rare disease for a country and for the other. 
many times that these are neighboring countries. That is one of the first issues that I would like to tell you. Our Ministry of Health is under the frame of a federal government system. So the provinces make decisions in terms of health, but specifically in the Ministry of Health, there's a creation of Undersecretary of Strategic Information and Medicines is in charge of generating health policies nationwide and specifically when this office created in 2019 that include this policy for special and high price and rare diseases and as a, an agenda for the Ministry of Health and also by the new minister. And this is important because we start to see a comprehensive approach to consider this in an interdisciplinary fashion and everything that is related with the pre and post diagnosis of this type of patients who present these conditions. And of course, the treatment or the approach of the cases that there's no drugs available. Another thing that I can tell you that only 5% of rare diseases have a treatment with medicines. And as Patricia mentioned, in Argentina, there's a list of 5,885 infrequent diseases or rare diseases. And that sometimes differ not only because of the prevalence of one country to the other, but the same regions present larger, greater prevalence. And there is a rare disease that in a country is rare, but in our country it isn't. And that is the importance of being able to generate a specific area in the Ministry of Health, which defines health policies in order to approach this in a comprehensive manner, everything that is related with this the topic of today, which these are rare diseases or orphan diseases are called in some other areas of the world. I wanted to show you when this sub undersecretary was created, and defined was a strategic policy. We created a specific area that has several lines, not all rare diseases with some priority lines, just growth hormone, spinal muscular atrophy, growth hormone, for example, there are four pathologies that are rare and have access to growth hormones. Then we have a line of priority linked to a consolidated purchase of factor eight for a hemophilia, which also a rare disease, and also the care of the myasthenic patient. To tell you what are the lines of work in Argentina that can be needed in order to approach this issue with a federal comprehensive vision and equity access. We have a law, and this is important because the law is the umbrella of all these pathologies, and it includes and defines pathologies that there need to be a list, defines that there need to be specific strategic lines, and the most important, it defines an area that's specific in the ministry that's going to deal with it. And this law in 2011 was had a regulation in 2015. And when we, in, in December of 2019, we started with this program, we didn't have the most strategic lines developed that had to do with a political decision, but had to do with the law and had to be enforced. 
of course, there is the need of a political decision to enforce the law because the law may exist, but it's not operational. At that moment, what we did is we gave life to that law and that regulation. We created a national registry of patients with rare diseases and started because we created, developed it at the end of 2021. And during 2022, we were able to have 7,500 patients. These are broken down by provinces. And as you can see, we have a map with the referral centers for, for groups of diseases where all of these can be, be seen in our web page. All of this is public. There's a map of our country where you identify referral centers of four groups of diseases, to totally dynamic, and it tends to be build and get become stronger. And of course, modify in the case of a referral center stops operating in the circulation of another one. This is dynamic and it's uh, very important for the patient, their families, or the ones who's recently diagnosed who know where to go. We also have a list of rare diseases. And in that list, we have, and it was modified on February 28th, which is the day of rare diseases. Today, it has 5,888 diseases. We say that rare diseases actually are many. And that makes that when you think in rare diseases, you think in a few number of patients. And it is believed that the universe in Argentina is for the 3 million people with the diagnosis, confirmed diagnosis of rare diseases. And there are very many people that we know that they don't have a diagnosis yet. It is also important for us the on-site training at the first level of care, which is the first link where you receive the patient, as you know, and you the same in the different countries of the region. And today we have 24 referral centers. We have 24 provinces. Each one has a the provincial ministry of health and those ministries of health were called referral for rare diseases and they build a network that makes us be closer and work with public policies and the ministry of health spreads throughout the premises in a more efficient way and the most important and as i was saying another of the lines that are fundamental for us is to treatment. Just last year, we provided 133 vials of Nuri Nursen for muscular atrophy. And that is part of one of the lines that I'm going to show you later. For SMA, we are also providing modulators. And today we have 21 patients with assisted with these modulators. In terms of growth hormone, we have almost the, in the entire country more than 500 patients. And this is a program that is permanently providing this medication. It's out of, it was very difficult to buy out of the pocket. Now, this is for patients who have public coverage. In Argentina, we say exclusive public coverage because there's no one who doesn't have access to the health system. You don't have a private insurance, you 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 have coverage through the public health system. As I was saying, the strategic uh, access to uh, approach rare diseases with a joint agenda with the patient's association, which are extremely important. They're the ones who know more about their disease the registry, the clinical practical guidelines and protocols, 
We also the quality of care with referral centers. In primary health care, we got removed from our head and add these health teams that are in these health uh, facilities and the myth with these diseases and why they think they cannot be taken care of or cannot be detected and refer to a primary health care. Also, we need to consider with early detection and prevention, this with a timely diagnosis, this care networks, the identification of these networks is our country is quite extensive in what we have in our country that patients many times have to go long distance to see a specialist. So we are trying to do is to identify and see how they can receive care in in a closer area to their home. There are diseases that have higher prevalence in the rare diseases and some are extremely rare. Perhaps they have one physician in the entire country that specializes in the treatment. The me mentoring for technologies in order to provide and generate access to generate the standard and regulatory framework for the consolidation of the program. And of course, research and to propose from our place the incentive with our research and development scholarships or what we're doing now is working with our institute in the development of a genomic network for the diagnosis which is also extremely important for our country. Just to show you a success story that we have, which when we started working, we found a severe issue that patients with SMA, because they had a complex situation of their health and their access to treatment with this new medication, which was the most expensive, with the $125 per vial is all judicialized. There were more than 110 protective actions and these legal protective actions required $125,000, which was initial loading those and couldn't be used because it was impossible to pay and there were no clear rules. There was an agreement with the laboratory that either the signing of the agreement by the private subsect, not for the patient who didn't have any coverage. So the health office celebrated agreement, but only for the private sector and a confidential agreement. So we didn't have it clear what was going on with that agreement. It was created of a SMA commission, 16 or 70 patient, 16, 17 patient, poorly evaluated, and it had joined to the ob obligatory medical program without any financing option. What I mean with this is that all had to be paid. But the whole system had to cover without any type of regulation. Now, where do we find the resources was the question. What what we did, several things. This was look at a comprehensive level. We potentiate that national SMA commission, make it work. We gave them uh, a role, not only to the specialists and pediatric neurologists, but we also gave intervention to multidisciplinary teams, technology evaluator, all from the referral health centers and the most representative health institutions. He, in Koname, we discussed all the cases presented with this indication. We review the referral centers. We collaborated with 
CONETEC, National Commission of Health Technology Evaluation. We respond to the access of public information and we draft technical reports for the process of protection. We did something, as I mentioned, quite interesting. In addition to strengthening CONAMI, we add mentorship, we define inclusion and exclusion criteria based on the scientific evidence that was available at that moment for this drug. We reduce coverage to SMA 1 and 2. And what we did is to cover for the patients from the public sector and force coverage for the private patient for those who finance. And we did this through a reimbursing, reimbursing mechanism. In this way, all the patients within the inclusion criteria, the coverage treatment, they, they have an answer in Argentina. So the cases for ENRASA start dropping today a patient that has an indi right indication and is registered in this registry by the treating physician is evaluated by an expert committee. And if they consider that is well indicated, the approved treatment and that treatment approval makes the patient in 15 days has the first four vials of this drug. Nusi nursing. We did a scale purchase. We estimated the number of patients we got to cover. We did a public bid. We established a price and we purchased the drug much cheaper than what you can buy it in the rest of the region. And really in patients who have uh, high financing. At that moment, we put a, a cap of $7,000 and then we would accommodate it. What I mean is we could discuss with the laboratory to see how much actually was being paid for that medication or should pay for that medication. This was done through transparent process, published, posted on an official web page and everyone has access to that. The most important thing is that today we don't have more legal protections that are old, that come from old treatments of patients that are outside this inclusion criteria that we have access. In 2021, we started 10 new cases. And in, 20, in 2022, only six new cases. The fact that spin rasa is not utilized anymore, this implies that it was thanks that today patients have a safe access in a regulated way, in an evaluated way for those who make that koname who are the ones who know more about this in our country. Today we have 205 patients in the registry that were discussed. Something similar we did with cystic fibrosis and for the approach of genic therapy that was approved in Argentina, for exactly all this strategy with this SMA, this is for the same pathology, was a, the basis for us to work with this new gene therapy. First one approved in Argentina cost $2.1 million and Argentina was able to achieve what I'm going to show today. Argentina is in this way to a centralized coverage by the Ministry of Health. We are at this moment developing an exclusivity purchase subject to payment per result for 12 patients per year. And the Ministry will only pay if that works. The estimated 
price for that purchase $1.3 million per vial, including logistics to the infusion center. The estimated total budget is $15 million plus the value added tax, but because this is going to pay according to results, it's going to be broken down in five stages. Every 12 months, we will evaluate the patient in terms of variable and milestones that have been previously defined in our all in published in the laboratory approved. We establish inclusion and exclusion criteria based on evidence for coverage. We agree variables for the discontinuation of payment that this is milestone that the patient has to reach, otherwise we won't pay uh, two months later. Technology has been incorporated into tutoring, so we're monitoring and we're going to monitor the evaluation of patients. We also anticipate the individualization of reference center for its application. They need to have specific characteristics. And the approval will be first by the approval for patients for treatment and the payment that is going to be required is going to be following the uh, ruling of the Konami. I apologize for the time. I exceeded my time. For us, this has been a very successful experience. Thank you very much. Thank you for your intervention, Dr. Natalia Messina. Excellent presentation. You have described an important and successful experience in recent years in Argentina, starting that you have a specific law to define rare disease and orphan diseases. In the, you also have explained us in the Ministry of Health for the strategic information that has allowed to regulate treatment and approach for these diseases. It's important to highlight that law that has also allowed you to have a listing for these diseases. And for that, there are certain strategic lines that exist. And there's also a defined area inside the ministry for their management. You have also indicated the importance to have policies for high price specialized medicines, which there is a large void in our countries to treat these rare diseases. As an strategic access in order to talk about a comprehensive approach, you told us how this national registry of rare diseases has allowed you to define these referral centers that are well mapped, the specialized centers. Mejor acceso al tratamiento de estos casos. Provide better access to treatment. Talk about this dynamic map of the country in order to identify those refer, refer, referral uh, offices. And then you've indicated these strategic areas in order to treat cases such as a comprehensive social care, the joint uh, work with the patients' groups and the guidelines and protocols that sometimes are difficult to have for this group of diseases, the early detection, prevention of harm, and a number of aspects that we need to occur in order to if what you are going towards to that centralized care. And you've also mentioned how you are sub you are con conditioning the purchase to results and that also can optimize expenditure. Thank you very much, Dr. Natalia Messina, for your excellent presentation. We thank you again and we invite you to remain in the room to conduct a dialogue in response to the questions from the audience. Thank you. Well, now, in order to address the key points of the UN resolution on rare diseases, 
progress towards its implementation in the Latin American region, I extend a warm welcome to Eva Maria Ruiz. Eva Maria is founder and director of LAPA, the Latin American Patients Academy. She has more than 20 years of experience as a strategic communication consultant for global pharmaceutical companies and healthcare organizations. She's a world leader in patient-based organizational capacity building and partnership development covering various therapeutic areas, including cancer, non-communicable diseases, and rare diseases. She's an expert in organizing forums and building coalitions of patient groups, physicians, public health specialists, and government officials to generate dialogues and action plans to address a variety of public health issues. Eva Maria was Director General of the International Cooperation Office of the Peruvian Ministry of Health. In, and prior to that, she served as Director General of Health Promotion of the Ministry of Health of Peru. Eva Maria has been a consultant in policies, development issues for multilateral organizations such as the World Bank and the I F A D, and she has also published articles related to health policies and regulations. She's an industrial engineer by training, has a master's degree in political science and international cooperation from the Sorbonne University in Paris, and PhD studies in economic development in Paris. We are grateful for the intervention to our dear and Eva Maria Ruiz de Castilla and you have the floor. Go ahead, Eva Maria. Magda, thank you very much. Thank you to the Andean Health Organization for addressing this important topic. Congratulations to Dr. Patricia Gallardo and Natalia Messina to talk about the reality that we have with the implementation of policies and what we are seeing in the region. I apologize because I'm at the airport. I had delayed flight, so I should be in my office. But now I'm trying to be able to participate, honor my commitment. I'm going to talk about the development and how this patient movement was organized and how this is being organized, which are the public policies for rare diseases and also to put in agenda this important topic. In fact, yesterday at a regional meeting together with Central America and the collaboration of Oras Conu to work with the work, clinical working group of the Ministries of Health to talk of how we can do the implementation of the registry of rare diseases. So there we have a lot of road walk, but this is something that slowly is being developed. And we also starting to do cooperation and the most important, the collaboration in the region with good practices. Argentina has a very good practice as a registry that is making progress and they have a mapping of the patient is a very efficient. As Natalia mentioned, they have access to cutting edge technology for diseases that are diseases of extremely high cost. And they're also trying to work in these agreements in order to generate the access to treatments and technology that the patients need to have an appropriate quality of life. However, in the region, we don't have laws, not in every country. Some countries do have them for a long time. Colombia is one of them, Argentina, Peru, the recently enacted this law or rare diseases and the regulation. But if we talk of Central America and the countries in this region, none of them has a specific law for rare diseases. And that has resulted that many of the groups get together to do this movement of civil society for this high level statement from, w, from the United Nations to call the attention of the need to implement policies that will help have laws and spaces where we can learn how far can we cover or the rights of the patients in order to solve their health problems. 
there is a lot that's still being discussed. This resolution doesn't have a binding capacity, it's just a suggestion for the member countries of the UN, but there's also a large movement of patients organizations or the scientific societies in the Federation of Patients in the region that are working in order to make their governments have more interest and put this topic of rare diseases in their agenda. So there we have an example of an effort that we do in jointly and Dr. Natalia and Dr. Patricia and many other stakeholders who are in the government and in the political action are trying to come together so they can continue developing this that we deeply need and patients are asking for. We have 22 international federations that have worked with this resolution. There are 13 regional organizations that work in Latin America and throughout the world with rare diseases. There are 39 national partnerships worldwide to develop this work with the implementation of the resolution and especially the work that needs because of the member states and governments can have an improvement of their policy or the implementation of policies for rare diseases. There's more than 100 countries that are being mobilized and many organizations that are working hand to hand with several stakeholders and we are developing a associative movement that has been seen as an example for the rest of diseases. The community of rare diseases is a special community precisely of the low prevalence or incidence of these diseases. There is a great strength in the development of policies and situations that make us work in order to have a stronger voice make their families have a support for better health, for social services, and a, an improvement of the quality of life. What we want to achieve with this resolution is to promote the rare disease topic as a situation of priority at the level of international public policy that promotes research, that promotes areas of work like the one we participate in today to generate better capacities for all the sectors, not only the government and sensitization and uh, assuming the responsibility for rare diseases, but also to make a joint action with all the stakeholders so we can make these policies be implemented, the interest and put into the agenda. However, this is going to take a lot of time. This situation started in approximately 2015 with this, it started in Europe working in collaboration with the Coordinator Alliance of the US and Canada and the partnerships of Japan, Australia and Russia to start to see how can we make this movement global movement. Then the many fora were organized and at the end they had the support from the UN to make this declaration where they talk about the need of involving rare diseases in the policies as a priority. And memorandum of understanding was signed between the UN and Eurodis. And in September of 2019, the UN include rare diseases in the political agenda. It's a political declaration that has to do with universal health coverage. Then we have many meetings that we are still the organizations of rare diseases are working where we're trying to convince the government and all the stakeholders of implementing better policies and to work for those people who 
have these diseases that are, as Dr. Gallardo mentioned, six percent of the population in the world. There are many people that have these diseases, but each one, because there are more than seven thousand, each group is a small group, and there's a lot of problems for clinical research in the development of new therapies that cannot be achieved as quickly as diseases of higher prevalence where the research is easier, less costly. And there is where we find this issue that not all the rare diseases have access to treatment, don't have treatment, don't have complete diagnosis and it's an extreme odyssey in the diagnosis process. People who suffer these conditions in general that are genetic in origin in the, that are found in, the ch in childhood is an enormous odyssey. It may take up to five to 10 years to have a diagnosis and then learn what to do and how to approach treatment. And that is a priority. And in many cases we have diseases where access to technology and treatment is of extremely high cost. Some countries cannot be covered. And there we have a dilemma. What do we do with these people and how to give them the right to health and with equity? That doesn't matter. We don't care about the geography and they can have access to what they need in order to continue with a good quality of life and survive to their diagnosis. We are working on that. And as I mentioned yesterday, we have discussed with the countries from the Andean region that were participating with Ecuador to talk about the successful experience in the registry in order to make decisions, have information and make evidence-based decisions, and also telling how they have implemented this policy in Panama and see that they are building a registry. There we had a very interesting opportunity to interact with Europe and Spain to see how they have implemented a registry in some communities and regions of up to 100% of diagnosed patients with a rare disease. So we, we need to copy these good practices and to continue collaborating in this global network of rare diseases and continue working together because more of making the same and this is going to provide strength to the movement and trying to work so this becomes a priority the problem that we have is this is not priorities prioritized the very few patients so they become invisible or in many cases we have the stigma that rare diseases are of extremely high cost disease knowing that in many cases we don't have treatment for many of them so we need to have that openness and to see how can we deal with this. The APEC has developed an interesting network that has to do with this political drive in the APEC countries, the Asia Pacific countries. And we also have a major interest in Europe, thanks to the support and drive that this associative movement has in Europe. In the region of the Americas, Canada and the US are the leaders and they are spearheading clinical research and new therapies. However, the right and the access to many of them is a utopy. And what do we do for that? I think that we need to continue looking at alternatives, flexibilizing many things. This is what Natalia mentioned have the, the interest in managing having a shared risk in order to make these new therapies be accessible, have greater access to research and to negotiate the purchasing processes and then openness from both sides, both from the private area and to academic centers and research centers in order to continue <laughs> that continue in the region of Latin America. Unfortunately, we don't have clinical research 
and there's not infrastructure for that. So there, I think that we have a, a capacity to collaborate and to make the research and technological development may be a reality like within this part of the world in the US or Europe where there's a lot of investment for developing new therapies. And finally, I would like to talk about sustainable development in the 2030 agenda, where we have something that's so important, such as the right to universal coverage, health coverage, and trying to see how from that, from there we can start working with prioritizing rare diseases and the implementation of better policies. There is an agenda for disability from the UN with WHO, where we are working for the conditions of rare diseases that have greater possibility of having disability. Many of them are neurodegenerative diseases where the disease is progressive and they lose skills and abilities. And we need to see how we do for these people have that quality of life that they can have despite their diagnosis. That also has to do with non-transmissible diseases. And for that, we are working with very important partnerships with the different institutions are being created and other platforms of stakeholders and several where they're trying to work and prioritize this complicated topic but I'm very pleased that we continue discussing and looking in the future. Now, I would like to conclude this conversation by saying that it is very important, the awareness, which is the knowledge of these diseases. In our region, we have very little awareness of what rare diseases are. We still don't have a harmonized distribution in our region to see how we define the disease. Each one has its own definition, and that makes us to have disparities, inequality, in access, and also information of rare diseases. We need government plans and strategies and initiatives to be able to consider how to approach rare diseases. There's no prioritization for this disease and something else that is also important, financing. Financing is still small and there are many other priorities. Of course, we're coming out of a pandemic and many other things that the ministries of health and health agencies are looking at. So there is no, there's a lack of adequate management for these people who suffer the disease. Another important topic that also has to do is a clinical practice guidelines and it should be updated in order to have access to innovation and the effort that's being done to find a cure for many diseases that didn't have cure before. We have high complexity treatments like gene therapy and other types of approach and treatment that are being carried out for some diseases. And something else that's still important, each diagnosis. The odyssey of diagnosis still prevalent in our region. People that suffer these diseases continue to have problems in waiting for during many years. We're not talking months, we're talking about years due to the lack of technology or lack of specialists and referral centers. And finally, lack of information and data that allow to understand these diseases better. And something else that is still important, the political will and interest of the stakeholders to make these people have better rights, more equity in the access and more awareness of rare diseases. We have an opportunity to collaborate in the implementation of the UN resolution. There's still a lot of work to be done, but this conversation helps us to identify what else do we need to do, what do we have to do, and what responsibility 
do we need to have from our corners in order to continue working on rare disease? Thank you very much for the invitation. Once again, my apologies. For this informal way I'm presenting, but I think that we can continue to discuss and be those ones who promote the awareness and the interest for the prioritization for this important topic. Thank you very much. Congratulations to Oras Konu for working in that area in this topic, fight the difficulties and the other things that need to be done in prioritization, but let's not forget of these patients that are few, but have severe problems. Thank you, Eva Maria, for your words. About what these people with these rare diseases are experiencing, and they live many years in void. You explain us the reality, how our countries in the region of the Americas and other regions are still need legislation. We have made progress, a specific laws to deal with these diseases. Peru has it, Colombia has it, and Chile. There are still a lot of voids in South American countries and from Central America don't have specific laws for rare diseases. UN has called the attention on the need of having these spaces in order to provide a solution and to consider the rights of these patients. You've mentioned that has, has a binding uh, nature, but it's a suggestion to the countries by that is still being promoted through the movement of patients and the organ patients' organizations are the ones that on a daily basis are struggling in order to gain space and making our authorities understand about the priority and the need that they have for those who live with rare diseases. This should be placed in, an, in the agenda and on the treatment of these conditions, there must be more political action. You mentioned the international federations that are working on that, the partnerships, the international uh, partnerships worldwide that are trying to promote the implementation of this on UN resolution, and always calling the attention to the implementation of policies in rare disease. You also told us about these different institutions that are working for many years. And it's also important to consider other actions like from APEC countries in favor of these diseases. Finally, you mentioned that there's no definition. There's a definition, different definition of disease in each country. There are no government plans or initiatives to deal and to consider them, the lack of finance, which are because there are other priorities, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, that and all the odyssey that our patients live in terms of their diagnosis. Sometimes years to be diagnosed due to the lack of technology, or referral centers or the lack of professionals that can treat or in diagnose. There are many problems that we need to face and this is a challenge for all the health institutions and other institutions from other sectors. Thank you very much, Eva Maria, for your words, for your presentation. We invite you to stay in the room for the dialogue in response to the questions of our participants. At these moments of learning and exchange of knowledge, it is essential to take space of your time to relax and start a mini session of physical exercise during telework. Oras Konu encourages the well being of those who accompany us in this virtual session. And in the next few minutes, we will exercise with an active pose to stay healthy, combat stress, reduce worse fatigue, and keep muscles flexible and healthy. 
please go ahead with the active pause. There will be no interpretation during the active pause. Hola, hola, muy buenos días, buenas tardes desde el Organismo Andino de Salud y el Convenio Hipólito Unanue. Los invitamos a hacer esta pausa de relajación, un automasaje que te va a encantar. Siéntate, disponte de estos minuticos y empieza. Lleva tu cabecita hacia un hombro y hacia el otro. Empieza a dejar la relajación de tu cuello, de tu cuerpo. Inhala profundo, exhala, lleva la cabeza de adelante hacia atrás, la idea es que logres desconectarte unos segunditos de tu trabajo y puedas regalarte este pequeño automasaje. Lleva la cabeza hacia el hombro derecho, con la mano contraria vas a empezar a hacer punzoncitos desde el hombro hacia el cuello. Haces como si la mano caminara, punzoncitos con fuerza que realmente distensionen, todo el tiempo con inhalo por nariz, exhalo por boca. Eso es, de arriba hacia abajo, ahora vas a colocar tu manita sobre el hombro y vas a empezar a hacer pequeños como pellizquitos del hombro hacia el cuello. Busca ese punto atrás de tu espalda que suele doler, que puede generar tensión y oprime. Esto también lo puedes hacer con un aceite, con una cremita. Ahí donde te encuentres, muy bien, regresa suave. Vas a llevar la cabecita al hombro contrario y nuevamente un soncito de arriba hacia abajo. Así. Con la yemita de los dedos, el movimiento, como caminando hasta el cuello, inhala, exhala. Muy bien, nuevamente manita sobre el hombro, pellizquitos, pellizquitos de arriba hacia abajo, intenta simplemente relajarte, descansar unos minutos. Haz movimientos acá en la zona del hombro, masajeas, masajeas, muy bien. Ahora vas a llevar tus dos manitas atrás del cuello, vas a empezar a masajear y vas a hacer como que deslizan las manos de atrás hacia adelante, como si limpiaras tu cuello, entonces inhalo, exhalo, deslizo, inhalo, Exhalo, deslizo, eso es, ahora lleva tus manos hacia atrás, mueve tus dedos de arriba hacia abajo, baja un poco tu cabeza y empiezas a hacer nuevamente los punzoncitos acá en toda la zona cervical, más que todo aquí donde inicia el cabello masajea de forma circular. Este es un punto de tensión que nos ayuda a quitar dolor de cabeza, dolores musculares, eso es. Masajea de arriba abajo, eso muy bien, con las palmas, con la yemita de los dedos. Muy bien, ahora vamos a terminar con un estiramiento que nos ayuda a terminar de relajar, mueve ahí los hombros. Lleva la cabeza hacia un hombro, mantén ahí unos segunditos, recuerda la respiración, inhalo, exhalo, cambiamos, inhalo, exhalo, palmas en forma de oración, colócalas en el mentón y sube la cabeza, mantén unos segunditos ahí, inhala profundo, Exhala, ahora al contrario, hacia abajo, abre fuerza con las manos, muy bien, regresa, eso es, a todos los países, Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Perú y Venezuela, desde el Odrascono, les agradecemos por esta pausa de tranquilidad, relajación, espero te haya gustado, chao, chao.
Bien, gracias okay. por acompañarnos. Thank you for joining us for this active break. We take the opportunity to greet all those who are connected and join us from the from Argentina, Bolivia, Brazil, Chile, Colombia, Cuba, USA, Ecuador, Spain, Mexico, Paraguay, Peru, Switzerland, Venezuela. We also have the ministers of ministries of health of Bolivia, Chile, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Venezuela. The Navy Medical Center from the Peruvian Navy, the Peruvian Red Cross Provincial Branch, Daniel Alcide Carrion National Hospital, to initiate a dialogue based on the questions from the audience. We invite the speakers to turn on their video. And during the development of this webinar, some questions have been left for us, and we will do our best to answer most of them. A question for Dr. Patricia Gallardo. Is it feasible to draft a shared definition of rare diseases in the region of Latin America? What opportunities does this mean to the region to share a single definition? Go ahead, Dr. Gallardo. Thank you, Magda, and thank you to who asked the question. Yes, I believe that we can arrive to a definition, as Natalia mentioned, and Eva Maria, because in this large number of rare diseases or orphan diseases, there are different prevalences. It's very difficult to define by countries are differently designed in terms of the prevalence. So if we could evaluate and get together and get to a consensus for a common definition with their parameters and prevalence, that would be very useful for public policies in the an approach for a response. Thank you, Patricia, for your answer. A question for Dr. Natalia Messina. What actions, line actions are required to reduce the delay of the diagnosis of rare diseases in Latin America? Well, Magda, it's an extremely interesting question. I mean, some connection issues. The most important is what I mentioned, at least from the perspective of what you have seen as, a, as experience throughout the world, have an early diagnosis is part of a comprehensive strategy. And I think that technologies and the use of technology for the diagnosis and the training of health teams to have early intervention is extremely important. Sometimes not only it has to do with economic resources, but also with well-defined and well-planned policies that sometimes can be moved ahead with the resources that we have. And they are extremely important, as Patricia mentioned, and with Eva Maria, the definition or the drafting of a common definition, at least for our region, will be very helpful but I think it's not one solution, but this is part of a comprehensive planning for these type of technologies, especially for diagnosis, which is a major issue that we find. It takes years and years and somebody can have access to a diagnosis. And that is, in my opinion, my personal view, the most important problem that we have for this type of technology. Thank you, Dr. Natalia, for your response. A question for Eva Maria Ruiz. Is there a window of opportunity in terms of age range for the detection of rare diseases? Well, we have something that is very important. 
genetic testing. It was mentioned many of these diseases have a genetic origin and are detected in childhood. I think that there we have a major effort to educate pediatricians and primary health care services to suspect and following that suspicious, they can work with the diagnosis and avoid this RDC that is dramatic, not only in our region, but also in many other parts of the world where patients go through the system and they have a very large road before being able to have access to a genet genetist or somebody that may learn or know about their diagnosis and finally get a diagnosis. So I think that the most important age is um, birth and something that we are lacking tremendously is the number of diseases that need to be detected. There are many uh, laws for neonatal screening, and I think that this will be a major opportunity to do an early diagnosis of diseases or the possibility of rare diseases in benefit of our patients. Thank you, Eva Maria, for your response. I have a question for Dr. Patricia Gallardo. What does the Latin American region has in terms of opportunity to access for genomic medicine and, and personal medicine from your expertise? What should be the priority strategies to allow the development and access to these technologies? Well, we have a unique opportunity in Latin America to do the implementation of public policies that have good quality and access to medication, training of human resources in response to the in response to the medication. We have the civil society that is strongly working with scientific societies are also involved, and the Andean organization is providing a platform and space for discussion. We, we don't. This is not a daily discussion. And I think that one of the strategies to be to horizontal cooperation, which means that countries with more experience with the le lessons learned, they can transfer that learning to other countries where they still are in a different kind of growth, like in the case of Natalia or Eva was telling experience in Europe or other areas of the world. These horizontal cooperations or South South are all unique opportunities that can guarantee that financing, not for the purchase of something that's high price, but to strengthen human resources, follow up of patient, many other strategies that's just beyond health. Thank you, Patricia, for your answer. Question for Dr. Natalia Medina. Do you consider that there's a comprehensive care of patients with rare diseases and their family members by providing access to medication and physical therapy. What significant experience can you see worldwide or the region? Well, the answer is no. We're just starting these problems. When I talk about problems, I don't talk about diagnosis or pathology. I know the, ac the access problem, policy, to have access to a diagnosis by a specialist. And the social determinants also have an important role because we all know the diversity in our region, the different access different. Many things that need to take it into consideration. Also, a gender look at this because many times, many times are the mothers who bring their children for care. And I think there are a lot of things we need. There's a lot we're lacking. But I celebrate that we're discussing this. During the COVID-19 pandemic, we start to discuss in international fora about 
rare diseases APEC has, as Eva mentioned, their approach, but all has been virtual. This year we start to see our faces and to discuss in more depth about specific lines. What we need a lot of work, I think we have already started working and this needs to be done at the regional level. We have similar problems, we have similar economic situations. And perhaps we have similar prevalences when we can all have a registry. But we need to start these first steps in order to achieve what you're saying. The, the, who asked me the question knows that the response is going to be no. I'm not happy in personally for the lines that Argentina start working. Not only patients with rare diseases, but all the patients with some kind of complex pathology may have treatment by the health system or whatever the health system is in the country that make up Latin America. I think that we should all have those patients with complex diseases, we have a similar response. So my answer is no. And some successful experiences, well, these successful experiences are the ones that we need to share and see between us these cooperation mechanisms. I'm sure that there are many specific successful experiences in each of the countries of the people who are here in this meeting. Hopefully, we generate more spaces so each one can tell about their successful experience and how to do the implementation, but we need the same umbrella. All the countries of Latin America need to have the same umbrella and establish basic essential lines in order to look with the same lens, with the same glasses, and start to see the results that are translated in benefits of the patients and their families. Thank you, Dr. Natalia, for your answer. Question for Eva Maria Ruiz. Can you share significant experience in terms of human resources training in health for diagnosis and treatment of rare diseases? Thank you very much. It's a very adequate question. We don't have enough human resources that can understand that. And as Patricia mentioned, it's important to start sharing and collaborating to see who does it well. And from that, with good practices, being able to implement those good practices in other countries or as compared to countries where they have prioritized these rare diseases from where they're working more in order to make that all primary health care physicians and all physicians at the university level, the very few people interested in understanding rare diseases. The genetists who receive a specialty who talk and understand this topic. So perhaps there we have the opportunity to work, collaborate, and make that the medical students can start looking and understanding this characteristics of the diseases and have more working hours in order to have more awareness. Thank you, Eva Maria. Question for Patricia. What percentage of rare diseases have treatment in, the, in Latin America? How to improve this situation? We were talking that many of them don't, you know, these diseases don't have a treatment, and we start from that. The, if we talk in the region level, it's a very low group of low number of patients who have access to treatment because of different reasons. Because, like Natalia mentioned, 
it was difficult access for treatment because these are people that have symptoms that are not diagnosed throughout their life. These are young adults. Once they have a diagnosis, they cannot access treatment that will change the history of their disease because the human resource needs to be trained to suspect when symptoms like a ulcerative colitis is just diarrhea, it's not infectious, maybe ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease. Most of them have symptoms and signs that the health personnel doesn't know how to identify. So in this context, by several reasons, either economic or access to the health system according to each country, of human law. And remember that we're coming out more with children, the pandemic that made the, the worse access to the diagnosis. And the, there are reports that between 70 and 80% of people don't have access to treatment or a diagnosis. It became more difficult with the pandemic. So today, we need to work hard on training human resources see who has better strategies for horizontal cooperation and sharing experiences. This is an approach. It goes beyond health sector research and determinants, poverty, context education. So you don't start to look at, at this. It's difficult to provide an answer. Thank you for your answer. Question for Dr. Natalia. Do you have information about the approximate budget allocated for research of rare diseases in the countries of the region? How the health sector can promote this research? Hello? Go ahead, Dr. Messina. I have some connection issues. I don't have the exact figures of what's allocated, but we do know that there are from science and technology, research and development, there are many investigations that are done in universities of many countries. In Argentina, we have a Minister of Science and Technology which finance research scholarships. And those incentives and mechanisms from we have a national agency of public laboratories. We have public laboratories that compete with the manufacture of med medicines in Argentina in, from a lab, from that sector, scholarships for, or, for projects oriented towards to rare diseases as most countries call them. We're trying that each one of the mechanisms and incentives proposed in terms of health include rare diseases as another line of research. And as I was saying, I don't have the figures with me because I don't have that information with me. I don't work in that area, but perhaps we should allocate more money for that. Because with the question I asked Patricia, it's been estimated that only 5% of rare diseases have drug treatment and Many times we don't find incentives for the development of this or research for this type of treatment because the prevalence of that pathology is extremely low and that needs not profitable from the perspective of the industry. And it's understandable. And there is where the states have to intervene to promote 
this type of research. This also needs the necessary technology, but we need to build the road. Argentina, we have some financing line for research and development, and we're also working and also for the diagnosis. The first ge Argentinian genomic network for the molecular diagnosis is for us extremely important because going to go across and generate equity to this type of access to all type of patients. There, what matters is that all patients have access to diagnosis when they need it. So I think that it is, this question is very important to think about the importance continue with research and that all patients may have or all pathologies may have an treatment. Thank you, Dr. Natalia, for your answer. Final question to Eva Maria. The budget to treat rare diseases is comparable with the high cost of childhood cancer? We cannot compare what's not the same. We're going to talk about budget. The countries differ in the allocation of budgets for rare diseases, but they prioritize some a little bit more, their high cost funds. And in these high cost funds, we have diseases of high cost such as cancer. So it, it will depend on the number of patients that the registry. That's why it's, this is so important to know and make decisions and allocate the finances so that 5% of diseases that have treatment can have access to those treatments. However, we still have a situation of evaluation of technologies that may be cost effective for those patients and also of the approval and registry of those treatments in the country. So we cannot talk a budget if there are still things that we're lacking in order to say that this is comparable or not because cancer has many more, more drugs approved and more treatments that have been approved. There's more research developed to find cure and by being a disease of higher prevalence, the expenditure is going to be higher. Thank you, Eva Maria. We appreciate the questions asked and the answers of our three experts. And to close this space, we kindly ask the speakers to, in one minute, give us a message or final comment in the order of the interventions. We start with Dr. Patricia Gallardo. Go ahead, Patricia. I would like to thank for the invitation and congratulate Oras Conu for their initiative. I'm sure that everyone who's listening our presentation of today has many things to share in their experience. I think that it needs to be the first of many other meetings to share experiences and to generate a joint support with all the stakeholders. Bajo, government, civil society, integration institutions. We need to work together with all the stakeholders. We have an intensive approach and starting to in Latin America, we can put them in the agenda, agenda which what we thank you very much. Thank you, Patricia, for your final words. Now, Dr. Natalia Messina, your final message, please. Well, thank you, Magda. Just to thank for this space, I and the and others ways of discussion are made stronger in order to work on this. I think we have to highlight the effort for the work done by the patients, groups, and societies because these are fundamental parts when we are going to discuss about the needs and also 
from their vision. This that affects them every day because from there allows us to design public policies convinced that we're in the right track. I think that this places like this, like the one you offer today, need to continue and increasing. And that's what I take with me, the satisfaction of the, the discussion and to think in everyone's commitment. So we start with a regional tour for a comprehensive approach for these pathologies with the special emphasis in their patients and their families and caretakers who also offer, offer lack of action or lack of planning. I think that the state must be ruling institutions for these complex pathologies. We have to use a, this as an umbrella to provide the important guidelines of how we need to work with this problem. So thank you for this space again to you, Magda, and my other speakers, and to everyone. Thank you, Dr. Natalia, for your message. Thank you for your time and space. Go ahead, Eva Maria. First of all, Magda, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been a privilege to be working together with experts. It's a happy to see Pan American Health Organization working on this much openness that we need to continue building that we still need in this region with policies and collaboration you're the platform to continue working on, on these topics Alia, your knowledge your training and your sensitivity that you work and it's an example and hopefully you will have more officials like you in the entire region that could fight for those patients who needed so much that are working in Australia and wanting to have that equity, equality, and justice, and on the collaboration that we need. Thank you very much for discussing these topics. We were waiting this for years. Have the opportunity. I think this window gives us the opportunity that governments prioritize their diseases. and implement laws and to work with quality and responsibility. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva Maria, for your time and space. Thank you for the important messages given by our three excellent speakers, our three excellent experts that today have allowed us to organize this event. On behalf of Dr. Calle, who's our secretary, executive secretary of the Horas Conyu, my thanks to all the attendees that week after week follow the Horas Conyu equipment and those who participate in this activity, which has been possible thanks to the commitment with the Andean and Latin American integration. To conclude this important afternoon, I would just, on my behalf, mention by listening our three excellent speakers that we have a large depth. Our politics, politicians and decision makers need, need to support from every level in developing policies that are executed Remember that there's no rights with no budget and a policy that has no budget allocated is dead letter. So we feel that there is a fear from our governments and decision makers to talk about this topic because it has been always been associated with high costs, with extremely high costs, with a lot of expenditures with a financing that they consider difficult to manage. And this is not true. That is why it's so important 
that we incentivate research so we can define treat evidence-based treatment. We've been told many times that this treatment is not being administered because they haven't proven their efficacy, but if we don't have good clinical trials to determine this therapy, we will continue with the same problem. Our health staff also needs to become aware, as you three have mentioned, how our, it's so sad to see our patients spend years going from one physician to another, and many times because they have general symptoms which are not specific, is confused with other pathologies, and they always think on the most frequent. Well, you don't think on this disease, and our patients are not referred on a timely basis and, and are inadequately managed. And this brings a high risk for these patients that they present disabilities. So it's very important what we heard, training and awareness at every level. Also in the first level of care, sometimes we think that rare diseases and orphan diseases will be seen in a hospital or a high complexity institutions, but that's not the case. It is important that all professionals from the first level are sensitized and trained to recognize a rare disease in order to do an adequate referral and provide treatment that it requires. Having said this, once again, I would like to thank all of you on behalf of Dr. Maria del Carmen Calle, Executive Secretary of Horas Conu, and all the staff for providing us this space of time. Thank you very much. We'll see you our next events, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and uh, greetings from Hora Conu. Thank you very much, Eva Maria. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Natalia, for your big bug.